you're never going to see the same repair twice. You know, it could be similar, but every single bass is different, so it's going to break differently. Players are different, so they're going to want to hear different sounds, different timbres, different, you know, feel different things. So, you know, it, basses, it, they're all puzzles, you know, which is very interesting, you know, when they break, you know, that's half the fun. It's just seeing how you can put that puzzle back together. Today's guest is one of the rising stars in the bass luthier world. He's moved into full-time bass making, and we talk about that and much more. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and today's guest is Ralph Alcala, who, like I said, has recently moved into building basses full-time. And before that, he worked for World of Strings, went out on his own, moved to Cleveland for a while, and we talk about that and much more, what it's like building basses, what he's learned in the process, what he sees in the future. And Ralph has actually been on the podcast before. He was part of our Luthier Roundtable at the 2018 Oberlin Violent Society of America Bass Luthier Workshop, the VSA Workshop. I was there. I sat down with, I think, 25 Luthiers. Ralph was one of them and had great comments. So definitely check that out if you haven't. Link in the show notes. And Ralph, he's a great guy. He's making beautiful basses. You'll hear some of his fourth bass being played. I had a chance to play on it quite a bit at the 2018 Latin American Bass Festival and just extraordinary instrument. So definitely follow along with Ralph, follow him on Instagram and keep up with what he's up to. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. And a quick shout out before we get started to D'Addario Strings, Upton Bass, Steve Swan String Bass, Colstein Music, the Bass Violin Shop and A440 Violin Shop. They help us keep the lights on here and more on them later. But let's dig into this conversation with Ralph Alcala. So here with Ralph Alcala in Tijuana, Mexico. And you've been here, so we're here for the Latin American Bass Festival, and how many years have you been down here? This is my third year. Third year coming yeah, down. Third okay. year. Okay. And you took you took a year off because you were in Cleveland, and we'll probably get to that. Um, right, yeah. And all sorts of things. But, okay, so I've got a question I've never asked anybody, but I thought it'd be kind of interesting because sure. I was talking at dinner. So uh, tell me what your parents did or do and what kind of effect do you think that has on what you're doing right now career-wise so my mom uh, for a long time was a stay-at-home mother um my dad was a construction worker yeah um so that that's what they did you know and then when they split up you know my mom had to go she was a seam uh, not a seamstress she, you, those vinyl patio umbrellas yeah she worked at a factory do making those okay um but, you know, they, they worked a lot. So I, I ended up spending a lot of time in school, um, in the band room, you know, playing bass. Playing that, bass. That's, that's kind of, didn't want to go home. So I stayed in the band room. <laughs> in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Grew up in Los Angeles, born and raised. Born and raised. Okay. Okay. Cool. When did you come to the bass? How'd that happen? I started it in sixth grade. Um, played for two years. Uh, and then we had a new teacher come in. Um, she's basically like my second mother. Uh, her name is Margaret Asato. And she saw talent in me and my best friend who also played bass, who in fact was actually a much better bass player than I was. Um, his sister was a fantastic, uh, cellist and, you know, some other musicians in, in our, in our group. So she basically took us under her wing and nurtured us and, basically gave us everything she had as far as teaching instruments and time, you know, and she just, she gave us everything, you know, so, and then, you know, she, she sent us to, to an art high school after we left middle school. What school, what, what was that? The, it, it's called LOXA. Okay. I've heard the, of that. Yeah. Los Angeles County High School okay. for the Arts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We have, in, I live in San Francisco. We have SOTA, uh, School yeah. of the Arts. Uh, what's, so there at SOTA they have, is, you got your academic classes in the morning and then it's all music all the time in the afternoon. Yeah. Is that kind of the exact same thing? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have theory, orchestra, small ensembles, stuff like that. 
Yeah. Did you? So you're starting. You're starting arts high school. Right. What did you think you'd be doing four, six, eight years after that? At that point, I, I when I entered that school, I thought I was just the hottest bass player out there. Like, you know, I was like, <laughs> no one's going to be like me. And I quickly, quickly found out that that was just nowhere near, yeah. you know, reality. Um, but I, it's, I stayed playing bass and for a couple of years, I just, I didn't know, you know, I knew I wasn't talented enough to, to, to make it a career. Um, but I wanted to stay with music in one way or another. And, you know, I would go back t- to visit my old middle school teacher and she, she's like, well, you know, she, I would help her fix some of the broken instruments. And slowly she would just show me how to clean out a, a seam and glue it or pull an imp pin out or struggle with a sound post. And um, eventually she just said, you should be doing this. You should figure out how to do this more often. And in my senior year in high school, I, I broke my bass intentionally, like, broke it and <laughs> what'd you I, do <laughs> well I, I i ended up getting a better bass yeah you know to play and i had an old beat up k with a broken you know i had a crack on the neck and you know my dad having clamps and glue at home you know i thought i could fix this you know, this how hard could it be um and i dug out the neck and just ruined the the mortise and all that and quickly realized i was way over my head um <laughs> So I went back to my teacher and she's like, well, there's a, I know a violin maker. He might be able to help you out. And I went to him. I talked to him and he said, well, I can't really pay you much, but, um, you know, if you want to help me during the day on Saturdays, help come in in the morning, help me with the yard, you know, do whatever I need to do. And then after lunch, we'll fix your base. So we did that for months, you know, every Saturday, go over to his house. I mow his lawn, clean up his house. I fixed his roof. And then, we, you know, we would fix my base. Did that for several months. Once we were done, he asked me if I wanted to learn how to do violin bridges and violin repairs and cellos. And it just kind of snowballed, you know, mm-hmm. for the entire year. Just that's all I did. And this was senior year of high school? This was my senior year okay. in high school. Okay. Like weekends and that kind of thing going yeah, over every after Saturday. school. Okay. okay. Every Saturday. Yeah, you lived too far away to go after school, but every Saturday I was there from, I think it was like eight in the morning to about five in the afternoon. You know, it was every Saturday. And so you were telling me this story uh, this week about you're walking across the stage, getting your diploma, your high school diploma, and then boom, okay, you're into the business. Tell that story. So before I graduated high school, I I was talking to Frank, the the violin maker, and and he said, well, you have two options. You go to violin making school or you go get an apprenticeship. And some of the violin making schools, I reached out to them and they didn't want to help me make a bass. I wanted, I'll, I'll, I told them, I'll make all the instruments you want me to. I just need help with a bass. And they all just flatly said, we're not going to do that. So went back to Frank and Frank said, well, if you want to deal with bass, you know, go talk to John Peterson at World of Strings. And so that's what I did. I went over there, talked to him, and left my information and, you know, didn't hear back until, you know, I graduated on a Friday and on a Sunday I had a concert and for whatever reason I had I left my ringer on, on my phone and he gives me a call and he says, I just want a school bid and I don't want to do it <laughs> personally. <laughs> if you want to do it, you know, you can repair these instruments it's just a summer job just for these summer instruments and i said sure of course i will when do you want me tomorrow morning so three days after graduating high school i was in a shop um and what were you doing what was that what was that gig like so again me being you know thinking way too highly of myself i i go in there thinking i knew everything and and quickly realize i didn't and you know, I, I would, I would, I, I had to fake it until I made it. Really, I, I would go up to John and say, "John, I, I know how to do this, but I want you to show me how you want it done in your shop." And after two months of the same thing over and over for every single job, he quickly realized that I had 
kind of conned my way into <laughs> that world. And, you know, he, 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 I was fortunate that he, he didn't fire me. He kept me on. And, um, after a few months I was done with, done with the instruments. Um, another luthier was giving up his bench to move up North and John gave me a spot and I was there for almost 10 years. You know, and what? So you got a bench. So you so you got your way in. You got your foot in the door. Yeah. You got a bench. You're at World of Strings. And so what kind of so ten years? It's a long time. What, yeah. What, what what were you doing those ten years? What kind of work was that like? So there, uh, the first two years was I did everything from you know violin repairs, violas, cellos, guitars. You know, basically any if any of the other luthiers were falling behind on any of their work they would teach me some basic stuff just to kind of catch up. So for the first two years, it was wherever they needed me, I was, they put me there. Um, and then after a couple of years, once that, that John saw that I was serious about working on instruments, he said, okay, well, you're going to work full-time with me on the bass side. And mm. after the second year, it was full-time bass work, you know, from the, from the morning to, to, to closing time. It was just basses. All repairs. So what's it like repairing bases? It's a very wide question, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's very <laughs> wide. <laughs> it's interesting. It's, it's, uh, you're never going to see the same repair twice. You know, it could be similar, but every single base is different. So it's going to break differently. Players are different. So they're going to want to hear different sounds, different timbres, different, you know, feel different things. So, you know, it, bases, it, they're all puzzles, mm-hmm. you know, which is very interesting. You know, when they break, you know, that's half the fun. It's just seeing how you can put that puzzle back together, you know. So it's, 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 it's a lot of fun doing that. What's, a, what's one of the crazier base puzzles you've had to put together in, you know, over the years? I'm sure you've seen quite a few. Well, we had um, a bass player, and, and this happened before I started working there, and the project was already on, you know, started. Um, a bass player had fallen, had either blacked out or something, and he just, he fell on top of his bass. He fell off the stage onto his bass. It was this beautiful old French instrument. I can't remember the name, but he he basically, from what I was told, brought it in in a garbage bag, <laughs> just all the pieces. And John ended up having to make a special bench just for that bass and piece all those small pieces back together for years. You know, just, just we would spend hours in the morning just piecing these little parts together. And I got to see this, this bass, you know, you know in, in hundreds of pieces into one full bass, you know, and after I think it was six years of me being there, like I, it was finally together. Oh, man. Yeah. So it was, it was a lot, and we only we, they were only missing one tiny like five millimeter piece, like you know, on the top. Out of that the only base. out of the whole thing, that was the only thing I was really missing. <laughs> so, so you're working on bases, but you got to have in the back of your mind making bases, right? But you weren't making bases, right? So I, you know, I wanted to make bases. That's why I got into this business, and I told John, and John, you know, he had the wood, but he never. You know, he was a full-time repair guy as well. He he never had the time to make a base. So, you know, he it was the base of advice he can give me. So, like, well, I can't show you how to make a base, but you can repair enough to where you could reverse engineer mm-hmm. how they're made. So you can see how they were made, you know, whether they're English, Italian, French, German. You know, you can see what fails. You can see what works. You know, if, you, if there's a particular sound you like, you know, look at it, see what makes it tick. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, in the back of my mind, there was always a catalog of information just being stored. Of, of I like this instrument, I like that sound. Why did that fail? Why is that consistently failing? Why does this work? You know, so yeah, after you know leaving World of Strings and I went off on my own. You know, it, it, I I pulled the trigger, I bought some wood. And just started making my first base, and which was completed um, last November, a year ago. One thing that Diderio Strings specialist Lyris Hungets asks a lot is, how can you keep your strings in better playing condition? Here are her thoughts. I, I get a lot of this question. You know, people often ask me, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of money. What can I do? 
And I mean, my, my answer is, is unfortunately really, really simple. Um, and that, that's just to clean your strings, to keep your strings really clean. And a lot of people, you know, moan and but that, you know, <laughs> because they, they clean their strings. Most people will clean their strings, but not often enough. There you go. Simple, huh? Keep that cloth handy and wipe down those strings after each use. Thanks to Dario for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, rest restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. Did you know that they regularly ship bases nationally from coast to coast? Contact their team to find out more information about the shipping process and how you can get your dream base delivered to your doorstep. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BaseViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Whenever anybody's going to the Midwest, and I lived in Chicago, Illinois for years and years, I tell them to go to A440. If they're looking for a bow, if they're looking for a bass, if they need some repairs done, if they have a student who's looking for an instrument, A440 has been serving the community for years and years. They're located just west of Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago. They do great work, and they've been a big supporter of bass events over the years, whether it's the Chicago Bass Festival or really any bass event. A440, you guys rock. Check them out at A440ViolinShop.com. And you got and you got now base two, base three, now base four. And right here in Tijuana, you got you, you finished base four, and we're playing it. And everybody loves it. I play, I, I played a duo last night with Aaron Olguin. Aaron played Ralph's bass. It's a phenomenal bass, and I want to get into that. But I I gotta add, okay. So you strike out on your own, yeah. And I, and then you're you're buying wood, but then you're also. Um, a whole bunch of other things happened too, and yes. one of them was this move to Cleveland. Yes. So an LA guy working in LA, striking on your own, but then you moved to Cleveland. Like, what? Tell me about that sequence of events. So this actually came from ISB in uh, uh, ISB in Colorado. Uh -huh. Which one was that? 2015. Yeah. Yeah, 2015. So so my wife actually went with me. I, I dragged her along, and she ended up loving it. And we loved the town that it was in. And half-jokingly, I turned to my wife, and I said, how would you like to move here? And she and she instantly said, yes. Let's let's figure that out. And, you know, I, I actually had to really think about it. Because I was joking, but... Yeah. You know, after a while, really talking about it, it's like let's let's see if we can make it work somewhere else, somewhere where cost of living isn't so high. So we, you know, throughout that year, we we made a list of of cities and what we required. You know, mm -hmm. a major symphony, uh, conservatories, you know, nightlife, you know, stuff mm -hmm. for for ourselves. Um, and I had gone to a workshop with Rowdy Moore to learn how to rehair bows. And he found out what I did for a living, and he said, "You should come to Cleveland." Um, I thought it was joking, but he, you know, after a week spending with him, he, he's, he's like, "No, you should really move to Cleveland. Like, you're needed there." So that was always in the back of my mind, and I told my wife when we were making this list, and she tells me, you know, I was like, "Well, let's just can you throw in Cleveland in the mix?" And she laughed the first time. I was like, "No, really, like you put it in the list. Like, like if it doesn't make the cut." It won't make the cut. So after, you know, months of, of researching and, 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 you know, Cleveland just kept making the list. It just, it, it, it hit everything we needed. Mm -hmm. Cost of living was low. It had a major symphony, conservatories. It was eight hours from New York, five hours from Chicago. Yep. If you wanted to travel, we can do it quick, you know, mm -hmm. short weekend trips. It just hit everything. And we came out to visit... Uh, in November two years ago, and she loved it. She she absolutely loved it. And we said, "Fine, let's 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 go to Cleveland." As soon as we fly back to LA, she gets a new job offer that what she was going for for a year. And we decided for her to stay in LA and have me move out to Cleveland for a year to see if it, it was viable. So that's how I ended up in Cleveland for a year. And then you're moving out there and you find out 
You're going to be a papa. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I, I am two weeks into Cleveland. Um, I don't, I, I, I can't remember. My lights weren't even turned on yet. Like, I didn't have electricity. <laughs> and I'm sitting on my bench sharpening a plane or, or flattening a plane that my, that Ronnie had given me. And I get a call from my wife and saying, you need to sit down. And, like, we, I'm pregnant. Um and at that point, I, I just I, I I didn't know what to think. Like it's still to this day, I still don't know how I got through that day. You know, realizing I had just moved to Cleveland, my wife's in LA, and we're about to have a kid. Yeah. And so, look at a map. Cleveland's not that close to LA. It's not close. <laughs> no, I ended up having to fly back to LA once a month for a week at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Making that making that commute and and uh, you you I've done that too Chicago to right. San Francisco I've had that too. it's a bummer yeah. trying to make it work starting up something new hanging out your shingle yeah and you got all these roots in L A you end up headed back to L A yeah so after a year you know it, it it I realized it it wasn't busy enough for me and I'm, I'm from L A it's a lot busier. Yep. You know, I'm used to a certain pace, and I, I missed it too much. Um, so I moved back to L.A., and, you know, at that point, I had started my first instrument, um, but it took me like three years to really finish it up. And I had some time, and I just said, it's time. It's time to finish this bass. So I took a month and really just finished the instrument. So you finish the instrument... And you, you sell this instrument, but who do you sell? Do you sell it to Peter Lloyd, yeah. who's who's one of the biggest names in the bass world? Teaches at Colburn, former Philadelphia Orchestra member, principal bass in Minnesota Orchestra, big name. How is how is a guy making his first bass sell it to one of the top people in the industry? Tell tell that story. Well, I I think I have to credit that to Andres. Okay. Um, I I was restoring a bass for him. Um, and I finished it right at the same time that I finished my base. So I was on my way to uh, Barry Green's house mm -hmm. when he still lived in San Diego. And I said, I told him, this, like, come up to Barry's house. Um, would you play my new base? Um, and he said, of course. He came up um, and he played my base and I took a video of it. And I posted it on Facebook. And right after that, I flew to St. Louis for Thanksgiving to spend spend it with some some family, and I get a call. I I don't know how Peter got my number, but I got a call from Peter saying, mm -hmm. "I saw your I saw your instrument. I, I need to play it. Like I um, bring it as soon as you get back into town. Bring it." So I flew back to L.A. I pick up the instrument from a friend of mine who was breaking it in for me, and I take it to Peter. I thought Peter was just going to give me some some critique. You know, he, I'm, I assumed he just, you know, there's a maker in town. Yeah. You know, I want to help him out, give him some pointers, fix this, fix that. Um, asked me to keep it for a day. I said, sure, of course. Um, I do have people waiting for it, but, you know, you're welcome to play it for a few days. I pick it up a couple of days later and he's like, well, I'm buying it. You're, you're not leaving with this base. <laughs> and I, I was completely shocked. You know, he, he's been nothing but supportive. He's played almost every instrument I've made so far. Um, he's threatened to buy another one. So, you know, he, he's, he's probably going to call me soon and tell me I want to play this number four. So, yeah, he, he's been amazingly supportive. And that bass is similar to this bass number four, right? Yeah, same okay. model. Okay, so talk to me about this model. Why? What? What's the model look like? Why did you just pick this as a model? Uh, talk through that. So this, um, uh, when I started thinking about ba making a bass seriously, I was looking for, I didn't have any drawings. I didn't have any outlines. Um, so I went online and I looked for double bass plans, you know, drawings. And there's a, a shop in Canada. I can't remember exactly where, but there's a shop in Canada that has about eight different plans for different bases. And I, so I bought the set, laid them all out, and with along with my wife, we picked this this model. Turns out it's it's the outline of Kurt Maroki's <laughs> Amadi base. So as soon as I started posting pictures, Kurt reaches out. You know, he's like, oh, that, that, you know, we, we start talking about his bass and, and yeah. you know, my new bass. And 
you know, he, he actually ended up uh, referring a, a, a former student of her, his, and she ended up buying the base number three. So she was very happy to buy a base very similar, or hopefully in sound wise, to his base, mm-hmm. you know, her, her fo- former teacher. So it's based off of Kurt Maroki's uh, Amadi. How, and this is the fourth base in how long? In a year. Okay, so you have four bases in a year, which is fast. That, yeah. is, that is some fast moving. Yeah, when I finished the first, when I sold the first one, I, I, it was the first time I had, you know, repair work is, is consistent money, but it's, it's not large sums. Mm-hmm. Um, when I sold the first instrument, I turned to my wife and said, I'm going to live off of this money and make another base. And I'm going to keep making bases until I just can't sell them anymore. And she said, she su- supported me f- fully. And it's so far, you know, knock on wood, it's, it's, it's been working out. You know, yeah. every time I made a base, there's been someone there to, to buy it. So I'm going to keep doing this until they stop buying my bases. <laughs> <laughs> so, so three of these four bases are this, this, this Amadi yes. ba- you know, model after Kurt Maroki's base. And then talking about this other base, which Ralph has shown me pictures of. It's a super cool, yeah. funky base. So Matt Hare, um, before I even finished base number one, he actually prepaid for me to, you know, he prepaid for his base, you know, uh, basically commissioned. Uh, it's a copy of a cornerless base he has. It's an odd instrument. It's it's super cool. It has this fun, if you know uh, Matt Hare and you go on his Facebook, you might see a picture of, it's a, has a face for a scroll and it's kind of screaming. It's kind of, it's really funky, but he, he wanted to travel with that base, but airlines being airlines, you know, things happen. So he wanted a copy made exactly like his, but with a removable neck and a slab top, which was not easy to find. But eventually I got it done and it's one of the coolest instruments. And it's a cornerless base. So, and it was made with completely without a mold. You know, he wanted to have that same look as his bass, which is, it's not symmetrical at all. It's a great bass. I love it. It I had a lot of fun making it. So Ralph's actually been on the podcast before, uh, six months ago. Yeah, right. in Oberlin at the VSA, we had this Luthier Roundtable, which people should definitely go listen to. Uh, it was really interesting. Yes. But I found that event as a as a non Luthier, as just a fly on the wall, incredibly inspiring. Just seeing these these people sharing ideas and tell me about that event. When did you start going to it, and why do you keep going back? So I started going uh, four years ago. Uh, this is my it's every two years. Yeah. It, it it offsets with the ISB. It, it doesn't want to interfere with the ISB. Mm-hmm. So this is my second time going. Um, I, f- I honestly forget how I found out about it, but I ended up pulling the trigger and going, and it's been the best thing. You know, there are so many bass luthiers at a, such a high level, sharing ideas, sharing technique. You know, you, you see how... Bases are treated different in different areas, and it, it's it's so inspiring. You always come away with a notebook just full of ideas and notes, and just you are trying new things. Um, seeing other makers in the process of their bases is amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we had, including mine, I think we had four or five bases being made by different makers there. Um, some I think most of them were their first instrument, and they were just amazing. The, you know, all the way around. You guys, you have guys like Arnold Schnitzer, uh, David Gage, Jay Van der um these amazing luthiers. Um, Robbie McIntosh, can't forget about him. Mm-hmm. Just amazing luthiers that are just so open with all their information and, and technique that it's just it's you can't help but want to go back and learn some more. It's this gold. People have said it. Many people have said it. I, 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 we're in the, I think Arnold Schnitzer, many other people, we're in this golden age of bass making. Yeah. Oh, right? definitely. Yeah. You, you know, as, as beautiful and amazing as these old Italian, English, French instruments are, they were made for a different era of music, a different type of string. You know, they, they, they were designed for a different player. 
Um, and so, and so now they're being retrofitted, they're being upgraded. So, so they're not surviving, you know, some of them haven't survived, you know, through some of these hundreds of years of, of, of upgrades. Um, yeah, most of the bases have, most of the most bases, bases have not survived, right? right? Yeah. If you just look you know, at it. Yeah. Yeah. So the bases being made now, they're, they're being, they're designed and built for steel strings, for players that are playing at such a level that's, ridiculous Mm -hmm. you know so these instruments from the get-go are built to withstand the technique the strings and all the tension of you know modern playing Mm -hmm. so they're they're, from the from the start they're amazing instruments as i think over the years how many times i've used colstein products it's just amazing i look at my base right now which has on the same bib that i bought while in high school that's a colstein's bib i can't believe that this thing is still kicking but i have my pencils and my rosin and all those other accessories in my bib and when i look inside my bib i see my colstein rosin which peter lloyd and so many other bass players use i enjoy their ultra rosin And I have my Colstein instrument cleaner that I've used for years and years to keep my bass looking good and clean. They've got Veracore strings, which Michael Klinghoffer loves to use, especially on student basses. They've got quivers, stands, so much more. Learn more about their accessories, their beautiful pedigree instruments, and so much more at Colstein.com. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass, which is home to the largest collection of double basses on the West Coast between Los Angeles and Canada. That's a lot of miles, folks. Steve's showroom is outstanding, absolutely worth a visit. It's located just south of San Francisco Airport, SFO, and he has about 70 basses on display. And these basses range from student entry-level instruments all the way to the finest professional instruments. I've sent so many students and referred so many people to Steve's shop. He really does great work. And if you're looking for a bass, you're going to find one that suits your needs, your playing needs, and your budgetary needs for sure. SteveSwanStringBass.com is where you can go. And thank you, Steve, for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Upton Bass String Instrument Company, a company that I have been such a fan of over the years. Gary and Eric and all the good folks at Upton, they do extraordinary work. They've been at it for a long time, and it has been so much fun to watch them evolve over the years. And a question they get asked a lot is, what's the difference between their Bohemian model bass and their standard model basses. And basically what it boils down to is they they come from the same basic outline, but there's much more customization available in a Bohemian bass. So Upton standard basses basically look like each other. They're either laminate, hybrid, or carved, but they're similar in their form while you can get your bohemian bass customized if you want hat peg tuners you want all sorts of other details that's the bass you can customize and if you haven't been to the upton website recently they're constantly adding new videos new photos new descriptions and every bass has a story and i love following along with these stories Visit them at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. There's an interesting uh, – we were just uh, – Ralph and I have been hanging out all week, and, and so someone was talking to Ralph about setup, and it was a really interesting conversation because they asked – basically asked you, do you think these strings are too high? And you came back and was like, do you think these strings are too high? Yeah. It doesn't matter what I think, right? Yeah. Talk to me about just your philosophy in terms of like setup. And so I take it there's not one Ralph universal setup. You don't no. come in and get the Ralph. There's not. Okay. No, there's a starting point, yeah. which I do for students, mm-hmm. you know, who literally have no idea what they're doing. But once, once you get to a certain point, you should be able to articulate what you like, what you don't like. You know, if you're a professional coming to me saying, is this right? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how, how, you know, how hard you hit, you know, how hard do you play in an orchestra or in a jazz gig? You know, you should be coming to me telling me this is not comfortable because of this, this, and this, mm-hmm. you know, I want it lighter. I want it more tension. I want it. You know, I, I want this. You should be able to pinpoint 
what you like and don't like about your instrument. If you come, you're if you're coming to me saying, "Are my strings too high?" They may be too high for me. They may be too low for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't. You know, what I feel is different from what you feel. What I hear is different from what you hear. Mm-hmm. You know, as we get older, we lose certain parts of our hearing. So, if we're twenty years apart, what I hear is completely different from what you hear. Yeah. So you 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 shouldn't be asking me if what I think. I should be asking you, what do you want? What do you want changed? And I can then I can go down that that road with you. This would be much easier if we had a bass in front of us and we were doing a video. <laughs> but let's just do a theoretical exercise. I come in and I say, Ralph, my bass just feels too tight, sounds too tight. What are some of the uh, myriad of things you might try doing, whether it's sound post adjusting or strings or, or wolf tone eliminator or you ha- what have right. you? What are, what are some of the go-tos that you might explore? Well, um, first thing I do is, is I see, I have you play for me. So I have you, you know, pull out your instrument, whether you're playing with a bow or pizzicato, and I just have you play for me. So I, I look at your body, I look at, you know, whether your left, you know, if your hands are strong enough to press on the string, whether you're struggling doing that, if the problem is on your left hand, right hand, whatever. Like I, I, I visually just try and take it all in. Um, then if it's not something on your end, I look at the instrument, I look at how high the strings are, what type of strings they are. Um, I check how, you know, the sound post position, how tight the sound post fits. So there's a lot of things that that I check before you know I adjust it. You know I, I want to see physically how you play before I adjust an instrument. If you are a huge person with very heavy hands, I am not going to make this instrument you know just really easy to play. Yeah. You know because your, your arm weight alone is going to overpower the instrument. If you are a small petite young lady. I am not going to make this bass hard to play with a lot of resistance. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I need to adjust an instrument to the player and just visually what I see. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and another thing coming from conversation this week, you know, you talk to Ralph and you get the, he, he, he has the experience of a much older guy <laughs> than he is. I mean, you're a relatively young guy. You're right around 30. 32. Right? Okay. So, um, but you've been doing this for many years because you started when you're in your mid teens. I was right? 17 okay, when so I started. 17. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I'm betting much younger than your average luthier. Yes. So why? Aren't more people entering the trade at that young age? And what could, assuming that we want more people getting into it right. at a younger age? Yeah. I think oh, we, yeah, definitely. Yeah. What are, what are some ideas you have to get people, uh, bring awareness to the art yeah. of Luthery and get people excited about it? Uh, what, what are you thinking? I know you got some thoughts. So they're, they're, the violin making schools are a great option. They're, they they really are, and we are seeing more younger kids out of high school attending these, which is great. But I feel that you know if 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 these kids at a young you're starting kids as early as three years old to play instruments, at some point you should be able to open, you should expose them to all these other aspects of music. It's not just performance. There is. Uh, a music business there is luthery you know it shouldn't be too hard to show a kid this is how you change your strings properly this is how you glue a seam it's not a terribly difficult thing to do if done right um i feel that if if an arts high school should have an option to show these kids take a class how to fix a couple instruments, you know, cracks, seams, things like that. Show them that this is a viable option. You know, there is enough work in this world for more luthiers. Yeah, there is not an oversupply. No. I, I would take, like, there's probably no. room for quite a few more. Yes. And and in any area, but there, there are some, like, here we are in Mexico, there are probably, like, even more of a demand in yes. some areas of the country. Right now, we're we're... I just had a, a, a bassist here who lives in Tijuana come talk to me about wanting to learn how to make basses. Um, and I basically told him, like, there, there's, if you want to make bass, it's a huge commitment. You might want to consider repairing instruments, learning how to rehair bows, 
you know, get, get, be, be financially set before you start making bases. Cause mm-hmm. if you want to make a base, you know, it's a lot of tools. It's a lot of money. You know, a bandsaw alone can cost you a couple grand, you know, tools, you know, chisels, gouges. It's, it's, you know, I've been buying tools for 15 years. I'm still not done buying tools, you know? So, you know, we're, we're in the works of, of getting, um, somebody from Tijuana, up to the states to teach them how to do basic repairs. Um, I also feel I, I it's a little project that I, I want to get off the ground is show some of these inner city youth kids that this is a, another option. You know, classical music in general is not mm-hmm. something that a lot of inner city parents should tell their kids this is an option for you. Um, but I feel that it, it mm-hmm. should be introduced. You know, to them, yeah, and like you're saying, there's there's there is demand for there people demand. to to uh, w- yeah. We definitely, I mean, anywhere I've lived, I've never thought, wow, there are way too many luthiers right. hanging around. Right? It's, yeah, it's you, always you, the opposite. You might have one, maybe two, if you're lucky, base luthiers, especially in any given city. So, someone's listening to this and they want to start. Uh, dip a dip a toe into the world of ba- let's just say base base repair base sure. three like what would be step one they could, you know it could be living anywhere I suppose but what what's like a, a first step that someone could take what I tell everybody that asks me that question is if you're lucky enough to have a shop doesn't have to be a base shop you know if you, any kind of repair shop near you just go and hang out mm-hmm these guys, you know, the, a lot of luthiers that I know are more than happy. You know, as long as you don't get in the way, they're happy letting you just look at what you're, they're doing. And at some point, they might just tell you, you know what? Since you're here all the time, pick up a broom. You know, that's how John started. You know, that's how my, my boss started back in the 70s. Yeah. He just it was that kid in that college just hanging out in the shop too much. They put them to sweep and then eventually they put them to rehair bows and then it just kind of snowballed from there. You know, that, that could be anybody, you know, if, if, if a luthier sees that you're consistently coming back, it means, and, and over a period of time, they're going to see that you're serious about learning the trade and they're going to give you that time. They're going to give you their knowledge. You know, they're going to have you stand over them and say, look, this is how this is done. And they might even give you a chance to do it. So just go and talk to those, yeah. anybody, just go and talk to them. So people should follow Ralph on Instagram. They should follow him on Facebook. <laughs> it's, it's lots of fun. You get to see the sausage being made yep. and it's really <laughs> cool and it's exciting. And we've been talking about the, uh, the next possible base designs, anything you want to share in that yeah. regard? So I had a plan to copy uh, an amazing instrument uh, in LA, uh, a, a lot bass um, that's owned by Lisa Gas. Um, but um, I just, you know, got to hang out all day with uh, with Gary Carr and seeing his bass that was made by Jim Ham, and it just threw me for a loop. Mm-hmm. I wasn't planning on making it a solo instrument until 2020. Mm-hmm. I might have to move that up. To next year <laughs> or so, this year, so we don't know. It, we, it, I, it's I, mysterious. There's, okay. some, there's a is... lot of thinking I have to do these okay. next couple of weeks. Okay, cool. Well, I can't wait for that. Um, and I, and it's it's exciting to see your bases going out there and Thank the you. demand for them. And and you're you're definitely a rising star in the base. Luthery world, no doubt about it. And I can't say enough good things about this bass number four I've been playing on. It's Thank got you. this like buttery, powerful, rich sound all the way up. I, I, I played it for maybe an hour yesterday in a bunch of different rehearsals, and it's just absolutely a dream to play. So you're definitely. You're, you're bringing a lot to the bass world with these instruments. Thank you. Thank you. And so be- before we wrap, and we'll definitely do this again. Yeah. This is actually our second time. I'm sure we'll do it multiple times. Yeah. We'll probably do it this summer with the other luthiers kind of in right. your cohort. So yeah, that, yeah. that's six months from now, really. But um, take me back to like around when you were walking across that stage and you get that call to work at World of Strings. Like 18-year-old Ralph. Give him right. some advice. Oh, man. 
Don't party too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Buy more tools. <laughs> Buy more tools. Um, take better notes. Take notes. If, if, if anything you're interested, take notes. I, 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 I'm, I'm dyslexic. Mm-hmm. So my penmanship and, and my writing, my reading is, I have difficulty with. So I was always self conscious, conscious about my penmanship. So I wouldn't take, uh, good enough notes. Um, I would say if you're interested in anything, always carry on a notebook. I always have a notebook on me. I have three here, one in my toolbox, one back here and one in the car. Mm-hmm. Take notes always. I remember at the VSA, I remember every single Luthier I saw, I had a notebook and was writing yeah. in there. My local Luthier, Pat McCarthy, he's got these extensive notes, goes to the date and sees it. So that's good. Yep. That's good advice. Yeah. Ralph, pleasure, man. Thank you, Appreciate man. Appreciate it. <laughs>